the end of King Solomon's reign over Israel, God told a man named Jeroboam that he would become king over all but one of the tribes of Israel. But Solomon wasn't ready to give up the throne, so he tried to kill Jeroboam, who escaped and fled to Egypt. A short while later, Solomon died, and his son Rehoboam was named king. The people were unhappy with the heavy taxes placed on them and went to complain, along with their spokesperson, Jeroboam. Despite their complaints, the king refused to listen. Furious, most of Israel made Jeroboam their leader and lived in the northern territory called Israel, where Rehoboam ruled over the southern tribe called Judah. After being a united country for many years, Israel was now split in two. The new king of the Northern Territory, Jeroboam, was worried that when his people returned to the South in order to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, they might be persuaded to become loyal to Rehoboam instead of him. So he devised a plan. He constructed two golden calves and told his people that they were the gods that helped them escape from Egypt many years earlier. Then he had a huge festival to worship these gods, and unbelievably, the Israelites went along with it. Then one day, Jeroboam was at one of the altars making a sacrifice, when a man who followed God approached Jeroboam and warned him that his kingdom would soon be ruined. Jeroboam stretched out his arm and shouted, Seize him! As he did, his hand shriveled up. Terrified, Jeroboam pleaded with the man to pray for him. So the man prayed for Jeroboam's hand and it was healed. Even after this display of God's power, Jeroboam still led the people to worship other gods. For years, Jeroboam and Rehoboam were at war. When Rehoboam died, his son and then grandson took over as kings of Judah. His son worshiped other gods just like his father. But Rehoboam's grandson, Asa, was different. Asa got rid of the idols and was fully committed to following God. The northern kingdom of Israel continued to be led by a series of wicked men, none of whom followed God. One of these kings was Ahab, who did more evil in the eyes of God than any king before him. Perhaps worst of all, Ahab married Jezebel a woman from a foreign country who convinced him and almost all of Israel to worship a foreign god named Baal. Because of this, God would need to send a messenger to set things straight. Good morning. There's a rumor floating about that I served as a goalie in broomball yesterday with the college uh, event, so it's just floating about. <laughs> served on a lot of mission trips, and uh, one time we were serving in Kentucky, and one of the families way up in the holler, they're last name was Hatfield, so I just had to ask him. I, I said, you know this feud between Hatfield and McCoys, that, that's still going on? And, and this lady was like, yep. <laughs> They'd been feuding from 1863 on. And the first recorded incident was in 1863 when Asa McCoy was returning from fighting in the Civil War and he was murdered on the way home. And a Hatfield, specific Hatfield, was blamed for that. And it turned out that he was in the hospital at the time and he could not have done it. There was a second incident that uh, 13 years later that had to do with a dispute over the ownership of a hog, and that had them feuding again. We're not talking about people who were like, you know, building a fence here, and I'm not talking to you. We're talking about people that are laying in wait and killing one another. 
taking shots at one another, literal shots. And this continued on and on and caused bitter division for generations. So I asked, it's probably because I wasn't a McCoy, so I thought I could ask this question. (laughs) I was like, uh, how does it keep going? You know, like, that's a long time. You'd think at some point it would just stop. And this woman said that her grandfather, on his deathbed, one of his last words was, get the McCoys. I'm like, man, it's like really serious stuff. So today, the Hatfields and McCoys of the Old Testament would have been these guys that you just heard about, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And our theme this morning, as we settle on week 14 of the story, is summarized in Mark 3.25. Jesus is speaking, and he says, A house divided against itself cannot stand. It's going to crumble. So it's, today we're going to learn how Israel crumbled. So let me tell you how this came down. Solomon was old, prophet Ahijah told Solomon that there would be a person in his uh, high court that would be the next king. Well, Solomon was threatened by Jeroboam and an attempt made on his life. He flees to Egypt, Solomon then dies, and so everybody assumes that Rehoboam, his son, is going to be king. So they appoint uh, Rehoboam, he's crowned as king, and there was a huge taxation that had continued from Solomon. He just was really taxing people to build all these things that he had this desire to do. And so When Rehoboam became king, a bunch of people who were loyal to Jeroboam come to Rehoboam and they ask him to lessen this huge taxation. Rehoboam's actually their spokesperson. So you have this meeting and they said, you know, please don't keep doing this. And so he said, come back to me in a few days and I'll tell you my answer. So he first goes to the elders who served his dad, these older experienced guys who I shared in small group this morning, I think knew that there was a revolution brewing. You can only hit these people so hard so long. And these older advisors go, you need to listen to them. You, You should... If you were a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they'll always be your servant. Do the smart thing. Of course, if he did that, then a lot of this revenue is going to dry up that was coming into Solomon. So he talked to his buddies. The text says the young men who had grown up with him, his friends, his buddies. Second opinion, and they basically told him, to tell the people, you think you had it bad. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Whoa! There's the big threat on the people. So at this point, Israel divides Almost all of them go with Jeroboam, the northern kingdom, Israel. Ten tribes, ultimately 11, and Judah is left in the south, one tribe. Rest rally behind Jeroboam. So this happened in 930 BC. This continued throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament. We're talking 500 And 30 years. You want to talk about generational effects of conflict? It is right here in the Bible. Division is a nasty place to live. It churns stomachs. 
It boils our blood. It robs us of joy. It ruins weddings. It undermines the church's witness. It dashes hopes and dreams. It crushes the spirits of innocent children. Whole communities and nations are divided. Jesus taught in Mark 3, 25, if a house is divided against itself, that house is unable to stand So that's basically the story. What I want to do today is look at this story and see how how it is, and and when we kind of do a post-mortem on this story, what can we learn from that to help build unity in our lives and avoid division? And there are some things here that I think we can take a look at. So let's just pray right now, ask God to speak to us, and I'm going to unpack these for us. God, I pray that you would come and show up in this place, that you would speak to us from your word, that you would teach us about some principles for unity that I believe could affect our lives, our marriages, our homes, our church, our workplace, our community, and even our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we build unity? Number one, we build unity by staying close to God. Solomon was not careful to stay close to God, and division resulted. This is so important. This story has to do with this tiff between uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, but really it goes all the way back to Solomon. Solomon went from where we read in 1 Kings 3.3, Solomon loved the Lord and walked in the statutes of David his father. Okay, so that's where he started. But then we read in 1 Kings 11, Solomon left the Lord and he allowed the worship of forbidden gods. So he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not wholly follow the Lord and the Lord was angry with him. And we read in uh, 1 Kings 11, 9, that his heart turned away from the Lord. And because of that, the, the decision of one man... the whole nation ended up being split. Now, I thought I'd tell you a big secret here about our youth. This might blow you away. But Jacob and Amy Hart are not the greatest determining factors of your kids staying close to God walking in unity with others. The key factor, regardless of actions at the moment, will be you. And primarily, my intent on the you is on dad. Dad will have the biggest factor. I'm convinced of it. The question is, do they see you with a heart after God? Do they see you praying? Do they see you praying with mom? Do they see that the Bible is actually important to you? When they watch you, do they see that you love God? See, this is a big problem in the evangelical church because we have a lot of good things going on in church. And so a lot of times... Uh, We actually, in years past, had a family, parents came in, and they were yelling at the youth pastor because of something that happened with their kid. And I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? The church is not here to save your kids. That sounds, you wouldn't want to cut the tape off right there, would you? We're here to help you be the greatest influence in their lives. So when they leave, and all of the activities and youth group and and all of the games and the conferences and the events are done, and they are growing up and making their own decisions, the influence that that they're going to have is memories. Did our family eat together? Did they pray together? Did my dad ever pray? Was, Was church ever important to him? So my appeal 
wherever you're at right now in your life, your kids might be gone right now or they might be really little right now. Are you staying close to God? If, if you don't stay close to God, crumbling is going to happen. So I just have given you several ways that you can do that with those questions that I've asked. I just want to know if you're doing that. And if you're here and you're starting out in a relationship, listen. We need to stay close to God. Number two. Build unity by being careful who you listen to. Rehoboam was careless in who he listened to. And it ended up dividing a whole nation that had never been divided since Abraham. Like just based on who he listened to, and so he decided to do what they said, and it messed up the whole thing. So I think we can draw from the text that we need to be very careful who we listen to. He should have listened to the older, wiser men. Maybe not been so greedy for money, but he listened to the younger men. And the result was the first time in Israel's history they divided. Rehoboam divided the nation because he was not careful who he listened to. So I'm going to turn that now. Who are you listening to? Who are you getting your advice from? Getting some good counsel from TV, from the movies you're watching, music that you listen to. Even your close friends, are you getting good counsel? And when they give you counsel, how do you know that the counsel that they are giving you is good counsel? So I work out at Anytime Fitness, so uh, there must be a rule at uh, fitness centers that, that people live by. I don't know why. But if like you're on a treadmill and it's like only... 18 inches to the next treadmill, there's an assumption that you cannot hear anything anybody's saying. <laughs> so the two treadmills over, there's a woman, and next to me there's a woman, and they're talking, and they're like this and their husbands, and they're unhappy about their marriages, and blah, 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 and I can't hear anything right, not a thing. And they're going on and on, and so the one says to the other, you don't have to put up with that. You know, you deserve better than that. that. That's, you deserve better than that. But what does that mean? Like, you should dump this guy and go find somebody else. I haven't seen her for a while. I think she got a divorce. See, who are you listening to? Like, does anybody seek God anymore? I mean, the God that, get this, the God that created the universe, who actually invented marriage and sexuality and the whole deal, maybe he might have something to say. Are we talking to him? Are we drawing close to him? Are you careful who you're listening to? Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Howard Hendricks said that every pastor should have a friend in his life who loves him, but is not impressed by him. That guy can tell you straight. Do you have that person? Psalms 1, 1, how happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of the sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. And he meditates on that day and night. Who are you listening to? Well, you can build a lot of unity by listening to the right people. Number three, Build unity by choosing a humble heart. Rehoboam had a very proud heart, and division resulted. Proud heart. Rehoboam feared losing all the revenues that his dad had acquired. In fact, he wanted more than Solomon had, and so he rejected good counsel. And the Bible promises uh, Solomon actually penned this. This is interesting, isn't it? His son is totally trashing his life, and his father had written, The fear of the Lord 
is what wisdom teaches, and humility comes before honor. Proverbs 16, 18, pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Does have been a good couple passages to listen to your dad? He didn't. Arrogance is going to take you out every time. It's really scary when you read 1 Peter 5, 5, when it says that God is actually opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. That does not mean that the living God is kind of like, eh, it's not a good thing that you're arrogant. No, the text actually says that he is going to set his, his direction in opposition to you until you humble yourself. So you thought you had a problem with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> you had a problem with God. <laughs> so arrogance never goes really well in life. The pursuit of a humble heart will be a powerful tool in helping build a family, a marriage, a home, a workplace, and a community. People in your workplace know that you have a humble heart. They're going to respect you and honor you for that. If they see you as coming off as holier than thou and arrogant. They're not going to do their best for you. Humility is a great principle. My greatest problems in my marriage and in this church have been those times when I have allowed my heart to become arrogant. I do not feel good about that. Do you want to be united again? You need to humble yourself before God and those around you. Get off your high horse. You are not the big cheese. Usually the bigger the cheese, the littler the mouse. Which means insecurity trying to demand respect rather than earning it through humility is never going to work for you. Most husbands who really stir the pot with their arrogance at home Inside, to be honest, they're, they're scared to death. And that's because you can put them in a workplace. They know how to manage that and how to finance it and how to make widgets and make that work. Relationships are a whole different ballgame. It'd be better if we as husbands could just say, you know, I'm really freaking out about our relationship here. Would you pray with me? I just, <laughs> I'm not really good at this. But instead, we, you know, we start posturing. And we, you know, are the big cheese. And I'm the head of the home, which isn't what the Bible means when it says that. It's like, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> that just brings hurt and heartache. Paul says to the church in Philippi, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. But in humility, consider others more important than yourself. Now, that's really hard to do when you're having a big marital fight. Because <laughs> you're thinking about you. Consider others more important than yourself. That would be interesting and a really big business decision if you're around the board meeting and you're like, okay, what we're going to do is consider other people more important than us. How do we make this company fly? Humility. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. That's a great passage. That's Philippians 2, 3 through 5. I know you wanted to write that down, so I thought I would repeat it. Number four. You can build unity by owning your part. Look at the story we just read. Solomon, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam owned, okay, we're going to measure this out now, percentages. They owned their part. They owned nothing. <laughs> nothing. Solomon never owned the fact that he chose to allow his wives to lead him astray. He left the Lord. 
pulled God's blessings from them. Rehoboam never repented of refusing the counsel of the elderly and listening to his buddies. Jeroboam never repented of fearing that his people were going to stay in the southern kingdom when they were down there to worship in Jerusalem. So he just made two golden gods and said, you don't need to go down there. You can just stay here. Sorry. It made a mess of things. Should have saw me at true light. I was screaming so bad it took the rest of the day to recover my one vocal cord. Here's the result, 1 Kings 14.30. There was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Well, there's going to be continual warfare at home. There's going to be continual warfare in your marriage. There's going to be continual warfare in church. There's going to be continual warfare in our workplace and community. If nobody owns anything, it's always somebody else's fault. I know a man in this community who won the respect of every single person in his business because he gathered them all in one room and he confessed before all of them that he'd had an affair with the secretary. And they knew with that they could not continue in a business relationship. The business chose to take a hit, gave a large severance package to her, and they went on. And there wasn't a single person that did not respect his guts to tell the truth, to come clean, to seek to honor everybody in that business by owning his part. Are you owning your part? Now, Jesus actually has a few words to say about owning your part. It's in Matthew chapter 7, verses three through five. You can apply this to any area of conflict. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and don't notice the log in your own eye? Isn't Jesus funny? (laughs) I envisioned him when he was telling this. He actually picked up a big stick and kind of put it up by his eye. (laughs) You're like looking at the little in the other person's eye and you're walking around with this big plank. Jesus is such a great teacher. Why do you look at the speck in their eye? You don't notice the log in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye? And there's a log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So, for example, in marriage, that doesn't mean that if you own your part, there isn't an issue. He doesn't say, take the log out of your eye, and we're done with it. No, he says, you start with you. When you take the log out, then you see clearly to actually deal with the issue. So if we apply this principle, you know, if you're dealing with your kids, you have, to, you have to ask, am I bringing anything to the table? And with both of my children, when they were younger, just because, like you, I struggle living the Christian life, I have specific memories of sitting them down and telling them that how I spoke to them and the tone of voice I had when I spoke to them was not something that pleased the Lord. And I had to ask them to forgive me. I asked them to forgive Dad for how I spoke to them. Now that really set the table for dealing with their part. Start with you. What I have found happens if both husband and wife are Christians, that if one person has the courage to start with their part rather than the other one's, we're pretty good at keeping track of the other person's stuff. <laughs> we got a big eraser when it comes to our stuff. <laughs> What do you mean? I didn't do anything. (laughs) Convenient amnesia. What? I did that. I said that? (laughs) Is my wife in here? Hope not. (laughs) Start with you. What I found is 
When one person chooses humility and is willing to be honest about their part, it goes a long way to helping the other person warm up to sharing their part. It's not just about who should do dishes or is your underwear in the laundry or are you not spending enough time with me? Those are the substantive issues. You got to start with a heart. Jesus says the best way to mend heart relationships is to start with your heart and own your stuff. Can you imagine if Rehoboam would have said, man, I'm just thinking about me and the money I'm going to get. Maybe I should listen to the elderly ones. Own your part. Own your stuff. Who goes first, by the way? I asked this at a peacemaking conference. The speakers and the husband and wife, like, who should go first? And the guy goes, the one that's most mature goes first. (laughs) I'm like, dang it. (laughs) Oh, I love you guys. I messed up more than you think. Now you're going to go, no, that's not true, but some of you know me. (laughs) This is just a dream that I have, ministerial dream. I'd kind of like to see the men man up and go first. I really would. It's not going to kill you. What's going on in your marriage right now? That's killing you. Crumble, crumble. Just go first. Own it. Yeah, well, she wants to go to counseling. Open your Bible up. Do not seek wise counsel. That's not a good thing. It's not in there. You work it out. If you can Get some friends. Need more help? Get some counsel. Do what you got to do. Oh, it's too quiet in here. Last one. Build unity by being conscious of your ripple effect on others. Rehoboam and Jeroboam did not care about the ripple effect. I don't think they even thought about it. So the operative uh, word here is being conscious. Be conscious of what's going to happen with the things that you say. I doubt Solomon thought ahead of time of the disastrous effects of allowing the worship of other gods. I, I think he just loved these women, and they're like, you know, well, you worship your God, and we should be able to worship our gods. And, and he's like, okay, that's cool. No, that was not cool. It was disastrous. I am sure Rehoboam never thought of the ripple effect of not listening to the council of the elders to split the kingdom. I'm sure that Jeroboam never thought of the ripple effect of his convenient choice to keep his tribes from wandering south by erecting two golden calves. It destroyed their faith. And like the Hatfields and the McCoys, when you decide to destroy a relationship, remember, it is going to have a ripple effect through generations which might be why Paul wrote in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with one another. Now, that has a lot of caveats in it, and it's a good verse because it may not be possible. It just says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace. So if you have a husband and a wife, and they're both like, as far as it depends on me, you got a pretty good shot of, of figuring this thing out. We've had church conflicts, and as far as it depended on us, we sought to be at peace, and other people said, forget you, and they left. You, you, you can't make this happen. You just have to go, what can I do? As far as it depends on me. I am sure that denominations that made immoral stances on sexuality had no idea of the ripple effect of those decisions that was going to totally split hundred years old denominations. 
Want me to tighten it up even a little more? I am sure that well-meaning parents fearful of their children sinning in evangelical churches and choosing to place hyper-legalistic standards on them had no idea that this ripple effect would drive them right out of the church. We build unity now by being conscious of the ripple effect of our decisions on other people. Again, the operative word is conscious. Now, no matter what's happened, you can bow before the Lord and bring him into the situation now and watch him do incredible things. On June 14, 2003, Bo and Ron McCoy partnered with Rio Hatfield to declare an official truce between the families 140 years after the first fight broke out. True story. The document was signed by 60 descendants from both sides of the family and Governor Paul Patton of Kentucky and Governor Bob Wise of West Virginia signed a proclamation declaring June 14th Hatfield and McCoy Reconciliation Day. How about that? I think it might be time for us as individuals, as couples, as a church, as a community, and as a nation to pursue a reconciliation day through Jesus Christ. And as people watch your lives right now, will they conclude that the unity that you're pursuing was being maintained by the pursuit of the living Lord Jesus Christ? So, let's see, do we have a concluding slide here, please? There we go. So, stay close to God. Who are you listening to? Choose a humble heart, own your part, and be very conscious of the ripple effect. So I want you to look at this screen right now. One of these, we've got two of them now, so they're the same. Which one are you going to work on this week? Which one? Pick one. Anybody else? See, this could just totally blow you away right now, what I'm about to say. Kind of tired from the rumor that (laughs) what I did yesterday, but contrary to what a lot of people think, I never, ever would have signed on being a pastor, if I thought that I just speak and you show up and listen to me, and then we go on with our lives. My prayer as I prepare and plead to God is that this hard work of studying and proclaiming God's word would accomplish something in our lives. So please, decide how you're going to be different for having been here today, okay? That was kind of a kick in the pants, but okay. need the worship team to come now. I'm going to pray before I start crying. God, I love these people. I thank you that you are here. I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us. You want to be part of our lives. You want to be part of our marriages. You want to be part of our church and our community. God, help us to pray for our nation and our president. You're alive. And you can powerfully help us to change. Bear fruit from this time, please. Help us sense your presence in this place. Bear fruit and decisions that we make to change with your help, helping one another. Amen. Let's stand together, please.